Good afternoon to you, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. It is Monday, the fourth day now of October 2021, and it's time for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Good to have you with me. Let's jump right in. I'll show you what we have going on out there. Still have Sam up here as of 5 p.m. coming up here in about an hour. If it is still a formidable hurricane and it makes it past 5, 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, which will be roughly zero UTC at 8 p.m. Eastern anyway, Sam will surpass Luis, and this is reflected here in this tweet that we'll come back to in a minute from Tyler. Meanwhile, we have the disturbance here in the southwest Atlantic. 90% chance it doesn't really do much, so I'm not too concerned with it. I'll show you why in just a moment. And then we have the leftovers here of Victor out in the open Atlantic. Really no consequence from that at all. All right, so really strong upper-level winds cutting across this system out in the southwest Atlantic, not going to really focus and do much uh, with it being so stretched out like that. There's Victor down there, really not much to worry about either. But then there's Sam, just remarkable what this has done over the last many, many days now, uh, coming from a tropical disturbance over Africa uh, probably three weeks ago now, honestly. I mean, way, way back when it was just an impulse, gaining steam quite literally over the Ethiopian highlands. It's moved off across the Atlantic, not impacting land directly. And yet, as I alluded to, this tweet here from Tyler Stanfield, the afternoon update indicating that it was still an 80 knot hurricane. That was from earlier today, 2 o'clock Eastern time. The 5 o'clock advisory will probably reflect that it's about 90 miles per hour or so. And if it can get on and stay a hurricane, which I think it will, it looks like it's still separate. It's not part of a front. It has not transitioned to extra tropical just yet. So I think it's going to hang on past the zero UTC mark as a tropical system, not extra tropical, not post tropical. And if it does so, it'll surpass, surpass Luis way back in 1995 as the seventh highest single storm for ACE since 1950. And I know a lot of people, no matter how hard they try, could not do anything more to care less about ACE. I get it. A lot of people just don't care. They're like, whatever, dude. It's either impactful or it's not. But for those of us that really track this stuff beyond the headlines, beyond what they do when they make landfall and all the incredible effects that we see, these ACE metrics that we keep track of are very important because it tells us the quality of the season itself and what the Atlantic Basin was able to produce. And this year, the overall A score is higher already than we were in 2020. Yet, understandably, 2020 already had more impacts to this, you know, at this same time. In fact, we were getting ready to deal with Delta. Hurricane Delta was coming up in about six days from now, a year ago. But the bottom line is this long lived hurricane, uh, still going strong up here in the North Atlantic, getting ready to cross 45 degrees north latitude. That's remarkable and it still has a very strong and solid central dense overcast in there and again the fact that it did not directly impact land that's also a big deal because you think about it Ivan in 2004 produced 70 ace points all by itself. Many hurricane seasons themselves the entire season didn't even reach 70 and yet Ivan did all by itself and was extremely impactful. This is eclipsing beyond 52, 53, 54 ace points when it's all said and done and didn't directly impact anyone. So it just goes to show you how fascinating these things are and I find it extremely interesting. Hopefully you do too. Try to share that passion with you all out there and give you these little stats here like what Tyler was tweeting about. Another interesting thing that Sam has done is churned up the ocean out here. You can see this cold wake as it has gone by and left the ocean in a disturbed state, taking the heat out of there. So now you have these cold anomalies showing up. This is from Victor. It's short life out there. But the rest of the Atlantic Basin, especially the Western Basin, the Caribbean, still running a, a, quite a bit above the long-term average, one to two degrees Celsius, depending on where you look. And then, of course, the La Nina coming on overall. Probably later this month, NOAA and the Climate Prediction Center will officially declare that we are in a La Nina. Officially, we'll wait and see about that. Actual sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, if you were to 
I'm trying to draw on it here. If you were to wade out into the water, let's say in Mississippi Sound, or out from Galveston or somewhere, come out from Gulfport or Galveston or uh, Vermilion Bay even. It's a little bit warmer in the bay up there, but Mississippi Sound, Lake Pontchartrain near Galveston and vicinity, 80, 81 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, we're getting into the 26, 27 Celsius range here. Not many fronts since that one big, remember just a, a couple weeks ago, whatever it was, uh, that big cold front came through and everybody's like, yeah, fall's coming. We had some temperatures in the 50s and low dew points clearing all the way down past Florida. Not anymore. Um, you know, the sun angle's not as strong, and so the water is gradually cooling off. But the biggest sort of mixer, literally, to get these water temperatures to cool is what we call CAA, cold air advection. Wouldn't it be cool if I had augmented reality, where as I said these words, they would just appear and float in front of the screen? That'd be kind of neat. Maybe one day we can do that. The Weather Channel has that kind of budget, and they do some pretty cool stuff with it. I don't have that yet, but I just thought that thought came to mind. These definitions, CAA, cold air advection, the horizontal movement of that cooler, denser air blowing across the Gulf, mixing things up quite literally, colder, denser air from fall and winter. That's what helps to do that. None of that's coming anytime soon to any significance anyway. So the Gulf temperatures are going to stay pretty warm, and it won't uh, shock me at all if we see, oh, got to turn that down a little bit. Somebody texted me, so we'll, there we go. If we see something develop in this area over the next couple of weeks to, I don't know, 30, 40 days, between now and the end of November even, next almost 60 days, let me put it another way. I will be surprised if we don't have more development in here, a couple more hurricanes probably. It's just the pattern is there with the water temperatures, the La Nina setting up. It's just the next week or so, we're going to be in this lull, which we desperately need. I got a lot of work I got to do on other projects. Well, I'll tell you about in a minute. And we've been tracking things actively since about the first part of August. So it's time for everybody to just uh, take a deep breath and relax a little bit. And I think we're going to have that before we get to about mid-October. And then I think the pattern should become more favorable. And the general area to watch is going to be roughly this region right through here. And that's climatologically where we would look anyway. All right, so anything out there this afternoon? No, not really. This is all stretched out. Maybe this tries to consolidate a little bit. I'll show you that in the GFS in just a moment. That's the vorticity signature of Victor. And there is Mighty Sam up there, not quite attached to the front or any kind of baroclinic processes up there in the North Atlantic. It's still its own entity, still very much tropical. So I bet that it does what Tyler was talking about here and surpass Luis there from back in 1995. We'll see once it's 8 o'clock Eastern or 00 UTC, if it's still a hurricane, it'll it'll do that. It'll, it'll claim the, seven, the, the top seven. All right. So the GFS going out into time. There's the disturbance in the Southwest Atlantic. Pretty strong trades, or brisk anyway, going through the Caribbean out of the Southwest Atlantic. And that's really about it. Again, no major fronts. There's a little bit of troughing right there. But we don't see any big, deep cold fronts coming in with dense cold air anytime soon. And in fact, I'll just say this. I should have brought a tweet up and showed you myself. But if you've seen these tweets, and you should be following this guy from Ben Knoll, He's been tweeting about this, that over the next few weeks, North America, the lower 48 in particular, going to be a lot warmer than we're used to seeing, a very warm fall for sure, and with that pattern in place, these water temperatures south of North America, Caribbean and Gulf, are going to stay nice and toasty. So let's see if anything takes advantage of that. Let's go out, there's 24 hours, and there's that little piece right there, and I think that's representing this piece of vorticity right here. I'll just point that out. Maybe that tries to briefly, you know, congeal. That's what the GFS is showing anyway. But look, those wind barbs in there, barely 30, 40 knots at best, if you know what you're looking for. And then it quickly kind of dies away. And actually, it tries to head into my area. I'm right there in Wilmington, North Carolina. And look, it makes a beeline for me. <laughs> Isn't that just perfect? Way to go. It's like it's hearing me taunt it. Oh, you're not going to get me? Oh, fine. I'll just 
you know, but this also shows you the strong sort of easterly flow of the high pressure sitting over the North Atlantic that anything that does develop lately will head towards the coast. So it's a good thing Sam was not stuck in that pattern. So here we are out at day five, and this is an interesting piece of energy right here. There's a tropical wave approaching the Windward Islands. So you guys down here, Barbados, and point south from there and even north, just generally the Lesser Antilles will say, you could have a tropical wave passing through. It looks pretty likely anyway. The tropical waves are well forecast. They're either going to be there or they're not. And this more than likely will be there. So at the, at the very least, some squally weather coming through. And we'll see what happens with this. We're going to go beyond day five here in just a minute. And also, curiously, the GFS trying to spin something up pretty late in the season there, wouldn't you say? This is way out at October 9th, for goodness sakes in the southeastern Pacific. So let's go beyond day five. There's day six. And yeah, something does try to spin up there in the southeast Pacific. And then by day seven, uh, a little bit more action here in the southwest Atlantic. This is all trying to kind of pile up and do something. There's a little bit of upper level energy with a uh, cutoff low in Missouri, but that's about it in terms of major cold fronts. Again, nothing strong coming. And then just for fun, if you want to call it that, looking out at day 8 and 9 and finally out to day 10, yeah, the GFS trying to sense maybe a pattern change. This is out at October 14th. So between now and the next 10 days, just rewinding it, not much as you can see. And then maybe some of that energy starts to pile up somewhere in the southwest Atlantic. Again, something trying to develop there in the eastern Pacific that we'll have to keep an eye on. But that's really about it. Again, I think a lull coming up and we could all use the break. Not that it's been terribly impactful, certainly, since Ida. And that'll give people down there a chance to deal with that because goodness knows I've been hearing stories. They're still dealing with power outages and the slow recovery process. And plus last year as well. We need the break. That's the bottom line. All right. So one thing I want to show you here before I say goodbye to you for today our tracking map. I've shown you this before. This is coded up from Will Woodgate. He's one of our supporters from over here in the UK. So we appreciate immensely the work that he has done. This is the track chart that we've got, the interactive tracking map on the Hurricane Track Insider site. All kinds of layers that are available over here. We can turn on our permanent cameras all around the western part of the Atlantic Basin. And then when we have deployments, for active storms, we add even more. You can change the background map, dark color, you know, all kinds of things, street maps, you name it. But one of the neat things that he has been doing, this guy never ceases to amaze me, is adding this very cool feature of satellite imagery, uh, the visible satellite from NASA. Let's take off this layer, scroll down right here. And if you're a Hurricane Track Insider through Patreon currently, Check it out. Log in and check it out. You go here. You can read about it. He's got these little notes right here that tells you sort of what's going on. None is the default. There's no satellite loaded. Let's see what today has. Wow. And it populates over time. So this is the current one from today. It's, it's, and you got to read about it that it takes sometimes it's incomplete. We're talking the entire freaking globe. You see? So it takes a while for it to populate each day, but this is remarkable. This is yesterday where everything is there. And you can go back and you say, what did it look like before that? And I mean, that is really, really cool. What we're hoping to do as we go forward, and I'm going to talk to him about this, he even put in our Discord chat that we have for our back end team, our art department, and some of our producer people, he was like, all right, anybody else got any ideas? Let me know. And I think eventually adding user-generated content to this map. Let's just go back real quick to the base map. We'll go to National Geographic, and we will turn off the NASA satellite. And I'll just give you a little bit of an example here. What's Mark thinking? What could we do next? Well, let's just pretend, you know, we've got our deployment locations out here of cameras. And let's just say, okay, we've got a hurricane that's going to come in uh, to the Houston-Galveston area, and we know we've got you know, 40, 50, 60 members of our uh, crowdfunding team that live down there and they're involved, they're logged in and they're interacting with us and they're going to deal with that hurricane. Well, hey, 
Maybe we can figure out a way for them to upload a video or upload a picture and geotag it from right where they are with a little narrative, a little story, like our own version of YouTube or Instagram. Not saying like we're going to reinvent that, but our own encapsulated social media world of weather. Beyond the cameras, we do have some cameras that are hosted, as I'll show you here. This one's down in Freeport. This is over at Wendy and Michael's place. They were impacted pretty heavily there by Nicholas recently. As this loads up, there's Freeport, Texas. This is down uh, in the Port Aransas area um, from uh, Mr. Campbell, if that'll load up for us. And so in addition to the live cams, it would be cool to also have user-generated content. And we're going to figure it out. You know, hadn't gotten there yet, but Will is the guy to do it. So just a huge shout out to him, all this amazing work that he's done. Uh, and in case, and I just got to show this off. You know, if I'm dragging this out too long, my apologies, but I really like it. I showed you this recently. I think I'll show you again. This is our camera system with one of our connected Kestrels that we've been testing uh, out in Pahrump, Nevada. Sometimes you got to toggle these cams on and off and they eventually come on. There it is. But look, you can chart the temperatures now and actually see these in a graphical format, like a bar graph as it's updating. Look at that. All that data, really, really cool stuff that we're starting to bake in to this interactive tracking map. Uh, all crowdfunded, all put together and supported by people just like you. So if you want to you know, get involved. Look at that. I can't even see it because I'm highlighting it in the same color that the background is. There we go. That's how you do it. It's a year long project. Patreon. It's amazing what this has done for us over the last three years. People from all over the world. Again, Will, he's over in the UK and he's put this together for us. Just remarkable. Uh, and just think about where we're going to go from here. And we're going to do stuff in the off season, in the winter, spring severe weather. Flood season coming up, uh, monsoon season next year, you name it. And then boom, it's hurricane season once again. And that is what we are known for, right? Right. So if you want to get involved, Patreon, patreon.com slash hurricane track. Would love to have you. And you can help shape the future of this. Maybe you've got some ideas as well. All right. Thanks for indulging me so I could show off some of what we're doing. I am proud of it. And it's pretty awesome. Have a good rest of your Monday afternoon. As always, thanks for tuning in. From whatever device you happen to be doing so from, it's great to have you. I am Mark Sutteth, HurricaneTrack.com. We'll talk again some more tomorrow.